All right. This time I'd like to introduce our uh, guest speaker today who uh, is here visiting with his wife, uh, Linda. Uh, Mike Scruggs retired as first pri vice president of, for investments at Smith Barney, now Morgan Stanley. He's published two books, which may be where many of us know him best. The Uncivil War, Shattering the Historical Myths and Lessons from Vietnam, and Truths the Media Never Told You. He's contributed to two other books, published over 600 articles on military history, national security, intelligence design, economics, immigration, current political affairs, Islam, and the Middle East, including a series of 13 articles regarding Afghanistan. His weekly commentaries appear in the Tribune papers in North Carolina and the Times Examiner in South Carolina. In 2008, he was awarded the prestigious D.T. Smithwick Award by the North Carolina Society of Historians for his excellence in writing the Uncivil War. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia, go dogs, an MBA from Stanford University, former Air Force intelligence officer and air commando. He's a decorated combat veteran of the Vietnam War and holds the Distinguished Flying Cross, Purple Heart, and Air Medal. He's a former chairman of the board of a classical Christian school, Westminster School in Alabama. He's also served as president of the North Carolina State University Humanities Foundation and was appointed by the governor of Alabama to the governing board of the Alabama Prepaid Affordable College Tuition Fund. Thank you for doing that, Mike, for our young people. On July the 1st, 2013, it was appointed by the governor of North Carolina to the Board of Commissioners for the North Carolina State Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. He and Linda live in Clayton, North Carolina. They're members of Peace Presbyterian Church in Cary, North Carolina. Their two sons are engineering graduates of Auburn and Clemson University, and they have three, and I know they're proud of this, grandchildren. And one of the notable things was that uh, Mike, uh, in the days of air commandos, before we, we often see the fast movers, if you will, the jets, Mike was flying in an A-26 attack bomber, a rather old dog, if I have my info correctly. And he had to bail out at night, one of the few to ever do so, from an A-26 over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I introduce our guest speaker, a fellow Vietnam veteran, a proud airman, who we're very proud to say welcome home, Mike. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, my fellow Vietnam veterans and patriots. And thanks for inviting me again. I was here several years ago. And I want to compliment you on a lot of things. I, I want to thank uh, Pat Gartland for inviting me and for Jim Dixon for helping me so much. Uh, and General Helmley, uh, I really appreciate you. I have bragged about the job that this organization does to the North Carolina Department uh, Commission for Veterans and Military Affairs. Uh, you're setting an example, and uh, we love it. I appreciate uh, Mark's uh, remarks in, in, the, uh, in the prayer. I think that's very important. Uh, I'd love to have a copy of that letter, Susan, that was very moving, and I appreciate what you've done for the History Center. The, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the ongoing battle for historical truth. You'll notice it doesn't have the word Vietnam in it. I'm going to talk mostly about Vietnam, but the ongoing battle is a long-term battle and it's still going on and it's something we're going to have to fight. Most of it comes from my book, Lessons from the Vietnam War. Let me see if this works. 
I don't know if it does. Oh, there it is. I go back. There, there's the book. And uh, they're for sale back here on my right. Uh, the hardcover is 25. The soft cover is 25 or 20. And the Uncivil War is also 20. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book. I probably told you a little bit about this the last time I was here, but very briefly. I happened to be in a Barnes & Noble after a, a Friday evening meal with the family. And uh, I looked down on a shelf and I saw a book and the title was Air Commando. And I thought, well, I was in Air Commando and I had no idea anybody wrote a book about it. But I, but I found out different. I bought the book, of course. And, uh, but actually in the Barnes & Noble, I opened up the book just in the middle. And I looked down and I saw my name. And that was the instant where I was shot down and we lost two planes that night. So in the next couple of days at the dinner table, I decided I'd tell my two sons and my wife a little bit more about that incident and other things that I'd done. And uh, after talking about 20 minutes, my youngest son, who's an attorney now, looked at me and said, Dad, well, you were in World War I or two. <laughs> My brother Randy was in the Army and he had somewhat the same experience. He closed his uh, career teaching school and he would always introduce himself to the students in their high school and junior high. And he would tell them he was a Vietnam veteran. And then after he'd finished that, he'd start a discussion with the class, and he would ask, what do you guys know about Vietnam? Do you know where it is? Blank stares. And uh, do you know when it was? And a couple had the answers, but most of them had no idea whether Vietnam was between World War I and World War II, or uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, or whatever. Uh, so we have here, in the public schools and things, an atmosphere where our children are growing up not knowing nearly enough about some very important things about our country, about our military, and about our wars. And my talk here is really to give you some ammunition so you can tell a lot of things that people misunderstand about the war. And it's about mistakes that were made, political mistakes, that uh, we don't want to let politicians make again. The, uh, <clears throat> we've got particularly with the Ken Barnes and Lynn Novak uh, series uh, that, that gives a version of the war which is, uh, it's got some of the facts and some of the people right, but it is basically uh, bad is right. Mar uh, it's, ba it's basically cultural Marxism, uh, what we know as political correctness. And uh, I'm going to try to give you some ammunition to uh, correct that. And uh, see if this will work again. Yeah, there's the plane I flew, but I'm gonna, not going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about more of the political and strategy side. And my talk has five principal objectives. First, I want to prepare you with the background and facts necessary to fight the ongoing battle of historical truth. Basically, I'm giving you ammunition. Second, I want you to be aware of some of the more serious political mistakes made fighting that war. Third, I want you to know the brutal reality of leftist and similar, similar totalitarian ideologies. And fourth, I want to make you aware of the role of subversion and subverted media in the ongoing war. And fifth, if I have a little time, I'll, do, I'll just briefly share with you some ideas of how uh, you as patriotic Americans can win the ongoing battle. 
Well, I'll explain who that is in a minute. The, uh, on January 20th, 1961, I was a senior in college, was taking an Air Force ROTC, I was gonna get a commission in about six months. And it was the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. And he gave an elegant speech and I want to just quote a couple of things that he said. Let the word go forth to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Later in the speech, he said this, let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and success of liberty. That was an elegant speech, but it was not spoken in a vacuum. Just one week earlier, Soviet Premier Khrushchev proclaimed the Soviet doctrine of wars of national liberation, specifically mentioning South Vietnam as the first test. There's some other facts you need to need know. I'm gonna give about, that's one, five more. And one fact is the Vietnam War was a proxy war really with the Soviet Union against uh, us with the Chinese contributing to major logistical support. Now, you see this picture of Earthquake Magoon. That was taken in 1944. Uh, his real name was his nickname because uh, well, for one thing, he was about six feet tall and he weighed 260 pounds, a little larger than the average fighter pilot. And he had a sort of a large personality as well. But he had a, he had a good record. He shot down four Japanese zeros and he destroyed five on the ground. But in 1954, President Eisenhower and the CIA realized that a communist North Vietnam would not be good for peace or stability in Southeast Asia. And so, although we didn't get directly involved in the war, uh, they had about 40 CIA crews, most of them Air Force or ex-Air Force, or just CIA flying these C-119 flying boxcars, dropping paratroops, ammunition, supplies, uh, howitzers to the besieged French uh, Union Army and uh, the French Foreign Legion. Uh, he was shot down actually the, the day before he had his uh, the battle of Dien Bien Phu was over with the communists, the victories. And he, uh, his, his remains were not found actually until 2002 in uh, northern Laos. They were looking for Vietnam veterans, or vet Vietnam servicemen. Uh, but in uh, 2005, he was given the Legion of Honor night class by French President Chirac and he's buried in Arlington Cemetery, was in 2007. But one reason I wanted to tell you about this is because that before we were involved in Vietnam, uh, the CAA, Eisenhower, other people knew that it was extremely important. And the French didn't lose the war just because of that battle. What really lost them the war is that they had a second front, and that was in France. And that was where the communists and the socialists were trying to undermine uh, the people's will and the government's will. And basically, they were successful with that. 
So the French Indo Warner War was a two front war. The uh, 1955, following that, we set up the CETO Treaty, Southeast at Asia Treaty Organization. Uh, U.S., U.K., France, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Philippines, Pakistan to protect South Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia if they wanted it. Another thing that you need to know, and this is according to Allied Intelligence and also Admiral Sharp, who was Pacific Area Commander, starting in 1959, the Soviet Union orchestrated and financed North Vietnam's aggression against the Republic of Vietnam and Southeast Asia, step by step, and finance their aggression uh, in that war. So lastly, French Indochina was a two-front war. Vietnam was a two-front war. It was an armed battlefront in Southeast Asia and a political propaganda front in the U.S. involving communist front organizations organizing protests, the media, and Congress. The late Harry G. Summers, there he is, uh, Colonel of Infantry, Infantry and Distinguished Faculty Member at the Army War Colleges often call people's attention to the fact that considerable difference in the treatment of the Vietnam War can be seen in the literature published in academia and that published by veterans who served during the war. Summer's background was he was a Korean veteran. He, he enlisted in the Army before he was 18. And by the time he was, uh, the Korean War started, he was a machine gunner, a corporal uh, in the Pusan perimeter. Uh, but he uh, had a, a great war record and he wrote a great book called On Strategy, a Critical Analysis of the Vietnam War. It was, he, he was all for Clausewitz. And he was an NBC commentator on the Gulf War, as you might recognize him. But he has had a lot of influence uh, since then, but he uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Summers also called attention to the fact that the perspective of veterans differs considerably among themselves with respect to the time of their involvement. U.S. involvement in the war started in, as a counterinsurgency counter role, but we were soon involved in trying to hurl back the North Vietnamese Army offenses, uh, starting with the Ia Drang in 1965. And he, he was one of the last, I think he was on the last helicopter to leave Vietnam in 1975. Uh, veterans' perspective also differs according to what they were doing, whether you were slugging it out with the infantry or artillery or whether you were flying Navy planes over uh, Hanoi or flying an A-26 over the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, or dropping 30,000 pounds of uh, explosives in uh, North Vietnam on B-52s. Besides academics and soldiers, journalists and politicians have made their contribution to understanding and misunderstanding the war. Michael Lind, uh, who wrote a book called The Necessary War, and it's a good book, I agree with most of it, though he's a self-described liberal, has also observed the ideological bias of academic writers noting academia's still strong connection to the anti-war mythologies of the 1960s. And here's one thing he said. For the most part, the academics, journalists, editors, and producers who opposed the Vietnam War came from the same liberal left political constituencies. As a result, the consensus story about the Vietnam War and the Cold War in general was it was slanted to the left. And he was certainly right about that. The modern intellectual straitjacket of political correctness has tended to strengthen the pervasiveness of anti-war folklore in the American uh, academia and in the public. I want to cover briefly six 
big mistakes that were made. Uh, the first big mistake of the Vietnam War was appeasement of North Vietnamese violations of the 1962 Geneva Treaty on Laos. Kennedy did not challenge North Vietnam's serious violations of the treaty, like 80,000 men in North Laos. This allowed North Vietnam to build extensive supply channels, later known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, for the invasion of South Vietnam through Laos and Cambodia. Second biggest mistake of the war was allowing huge enemy sanctuaries in both Laos and Cambodia. Thus, Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, compounded Kennedy's era by continuing the charade that Laos and Cambodia were neutral country that could not be violated by Allied troops. Initially, uh, air commandos were stationed in Thailand uh, were allowed some uh, light bombing. And it was treated as a secret war. South Vietnamese armies and the U.S. armies had to defend against 640 miles of Lao and Cambodian border rather than just the 40 mile DMV. Behind those borders, large enemy concentrations of troops and supply depots were secure from attack. This also gave the enemy considerable freedom of action and strong possibilities for military and guerrilla initiatives against South Vietnam. Giving your enemies the initiative in war is Russian roulette with five bullets in a six bullet chamber. The third big mistake was South Vietnamese regime change initiated by President Kennedy. In May of 1963, the Kennedy administration began to encourage and abet a military overthrow of the South Vietnamese government of President Ngo Dinh Diem. Uh, I try to pronounce Vietnamese right, uh, but my pronunciation usually means that neither Americans nor Vietnamese can understand me. But, uh, but you know who he was. Uh, Kennedy was reacting to the negative media coverage of Diem receiving in the New York Times and other liberal media regarding the Buddhist protest over alleged discrimination. The discrimination charges were political fabrication, and I won't go into detail of that, but there's a lot of detail in Richard Nixon's book, uh, No More Vietnams. But the fabrications and demonstrations were orchestrated by left-wing Buddhists connected with North Vietnam. Vice President Johnson, the CIA director John McComb, former South Vietnamese ambassador, ambassador Frederick Nolting, and Joint Chief of Staff General Maxwell Taylor all opposed any regime change. But Kennedy was more influenced by liberal reporters and media reports. On June 11th, you may remember this, Fitch Quan Duc, a Buddhist monk clothed in saffron yellow robes and sitting in the Buddhist posture of prayer, was doused with gasoline and set himself on fire. Thousands of pre-mimeographed copies of his thoughts were distributed by the militant Buddhist cadre who had recruited him. A small group of liberal American journalists had been tipped off to the event and the dramatic photograph and critical commentary were soon seen on the pages of thousands of newspapers and magazines around the world. Zim's popula popularity in the United States plummeted and American media criticism of U.S. advisory role in South Vietnam escalated, led by the influential New York Times. The military coup headed by Duong Vang big men, the big was just because he was six feet tall, it's big for a Vietnamese, occurred on November 1st. Ziem and his brother and chief advisor, No Dien Nu, were killed by the military hunter the next day. Kennedy was shocked that the brothers who had been promised a safe passage out had killed or shot instead. Now, this regime change led to more than two years of unstable government 
and military leadership in South Vietnam. The South Vietnamese presidency became a revolving door with 10 changes in government for two years. North Vietnam's communist leaders could not believe their good fortune. North Vietnam put over 240,000 troops into South Vietnam between 1964 and 1967. Viet Cong auxiliaries increased threefold to 120,000. This led to more extensive commitments of American manpower to save South Vietnam. President Johnson, who succeeded to the presidency of Kennedy after his own assassination just three weeks later, November, November 22nd, called the overthrow of GM the biggest mistake of the Vietnam War. President Nixon, writing in 1985, agreed that it was one of the three greatest mistakes of the war. John F. Kennedy was strongly anti-communist, but his overly strong desire to curry favor with the liberal media pushed him into a regime change that was a colossal foreign policy and military disaster. The fourth major era in Vietnam what is the, this is one of about 13 I've written of, the, uh, and I'm gonna go, not going to go over them all, uh, was that Johnson and McNamara's theory of warfare, various called graded escalation, gradual escalation, and the doctrine of gradualisms are sometimes just the slow squeeze. It was the brainchild of Harvard, Harvard academics and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. It was uh, who McNamara was his foremost uh, advocate, Lyndon Johnson was his most faithful executive disciple. However bright the strategy graded escalation might have seemed to Harvard whiz kids and theorists, it went against the accumulated wisdom of centuries. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, Pacific Area Commander Admiral Sharp, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the State Department Intelligence Agency, and Secretary of State Dean Rusk all strongly opposed it. And yet it went on. The Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff and the intelligence agencies consistently advocated quick and decisive action against North Vietnam, including bombing critical military, air, naval transportation, industrial and fuel storage targets in all parts of North Vietnam, especially those near Hanoi and Haiphong. The Navy advocated aerial mining of Haiphong's strategy, strategic port. Conventional military wisdom is to hit an enemy as hard and fast as you can to maximize his cost and minimize your own risk and cost. A Marine gunnery sergeant once gave this advice Hit them as hard as you can when they ain't looking. Giving the enemy plenty of time has few experienced survivors. A fifth big mistake was the failure to utilize our most powerful military assets, our overwhelming superiority in air and naval power early in the conflict. Pacific Area Commander uh, Sinkpack, Admiral Grant Sharp, uh, Grant Sharp's name was U.S. Grant Sharp. U.S. Grant. I'm a southern boy, but uh, Admiral Sharp happens to be one of my Vietnam heroes. President Johnson's Operation Rolling Thunder was an exercise of the timid gradualism theory of warfare applied to air warfare. We lost 922 aircraft over North Vietnam making highly restricted attacks against non-strategic, mostly lower priority targets. We lost 298 of 833 F-105s ever made, playing what Admiral Sharp called powder puff air warfare. More than 2,000 aircraft were lost in Southeast Asia playing powder puff air warfare. While North Vietnam built its air defenses around Hanoi and Haiphong, from almost nothing in 1965 to almost 6,000 anti-aircraft guns, 250 SAM sites, and 101 fighter aircraft by 1968. Uh, Admiral Grant wrote a great book called Strategy for Defeat. And I want to give you a couple of quotes from uh, Admiral Grant. We could have flattened every 
war-making facility in North Vietnam, but the hand ringers had center stage. The anti-war elements were in full cry. The most powerful country in the world did not have the willpower needed to meet the situation. And then the fruitless negotiations drone on in Paris with no real progress in sight. We were sitting back and allowing these bandits to do just what they pleased in South Vietnam without retaliating on their own country at a time when we had aircraft carriers and airfields full of planes that could have gone up and blasted Hanoi and Haiphong wide open. If we had just been be given the go sign, it was the most asinine way to fight a war that possibly could be imagined. Admiral Sharp and the Joint Chiefs of uh, Staff had six major confrontations with uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara over the timid use of air power and naval power, naval power and the sanctuary situations and basically the rules of engagement. Uh, Johnson ordered 16 bombing halts as an encouragement for Hanoi to negotiate. We never got anything from them. They took fully advantage to resupply and every advantage they could. A sixth prominent mistake in the Vietnam War was that President Johnson and Secretary of Defense continually refused to listen to the experience and, ac and accumulated wisdom of military chiefs and micromanaged military operations. From the beginning of the rolling thunder until 1967, all the planning for airstrikes was done at a Tuesday luncheon in Washington. Those attending were Johnson, McNamara, Secretary of State Dane Russ, Presidential Assistant Walt Rastall, and the Presidential Secretary, initially Bill Moyers, and Assistant Secretary of Defense John McNaughton, former Harvard faculty member and mathematical game theorist who wielded enormous influence over McNamara. Now listen to this. No military or naval officer was included in that planning not even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff until late 1967. The targets, the dates, the hour, the number, and the type of aircraft, the bomb loads, and many of the tactics were specified in Washington and passed through the intermediate headquarters, the Air Force squadrons, and Navy carriers affected. Thus, Johnson super centralized even tactical decisions and micromanaged the war. There is one myth about the Vietnam War that I, I think probably uh, Del, Del Vecchio covered, but it's so important I'll just cover it briefly again. It's the myth that Vietnam was an unwinnable war. According to Admiral Sharp, uh, Harry Summers, many others, other high-ranking military officers, we could have won the war any time we had the will and resolve to do so. We could have won it easily in 1965 before Hanoi and Haiphong were surrounded by the greatest air defense system since World War II. We could have won it in mid to late 1967 when a logistical manpower crosser, crossover occurred. Hanoi was losing more men and supplies than they could replace and so we were beginning to win the war and they knew it. We certainly could have won following the disastrous losses suffered by the VC and NVA during the Tet Offensive. We did win it in December 1972, but Congress gave the victory away. On April 13, 1975, on the eve of the fall of Cambodia and 17 days from the fall of South Vietnam on April 30th, the New York Times columnist Sidney Scheinberg posted an article headlined Indochina without Americans for most a better life. The author's point, typical of liberal journalists during the Vietnam conflict and since, was that because of the possibility of civilian casualties from the American bombing, most Cambodians would be better off under communism. <laughs> 
but although there were occasionally some collateral casualties connected to American bombing in Cambodia, American bombers were bombing Khmer Rouge forces trying to overthrow the Cambodian capital, not Cambodian villages. In fact, U.S. policy emphatically stressed that the risk of collateral civilian casualties should be memorized, not memorized, minimized, minimized, and that should have been memorized. My own combat experience in Southeast Asia confirmed that that policy was often stated and strictly enforced. Yet, despite enormous evidence to the contrary, most liberal journalists convinced themselves and many of their readers that Americans were villains at the North Vietnamese and Cambodian Khmer Rouge communists were nationalist reformers who would stabilize Cambodia after a few scores were settled. Governed by these distorted presuppositions, Schoenberg and the New York Times found it difficult to imagine how the lives of ordinary people in Indochina could be anything but better with the Americans gone. Schoenberg even asserted that it would be absurdly biased to believe that brutality and sadism would be a national policy under communist government once the war is over. Events prove Schoenberg, the New York Times, <clears throat> and their anti-war allies in Congress disastrously wrong. Following the fall of Cambodia on April 17th and South Vietnam on April 30th, 1975, there occurred a bloodbath and of astonishing numbers and brutality. Cambodia, in Cambodia, more than 100,000 people suspected of being enemies of the new communist order were rounded up and summarily executed by bludgeoning, stabbing, or shooting. Most were buried in mass graves. These included especially soldiers, teachers, intellectuals, government officials, religious leaders, prominent business people, and those who had some contact with the West. Paul Pot, and that's his picture, and the leaders of the Khmer Rouge wasted no time in implementing a plan to reconstruct Cambodian into a doctrinal mild, Maoist paradise. At gunpoint, three million people were abruptly herded from their city homes to the countrysides and jungles. Soldiers opened fire on anyone who resisted or lingered. The sick and dying in hospitals were exterminated with ruthless indifference. In Siem Rip, more than 100 seriously ill patients were murdered in their beds with knives and clubs. Another 20,000 sick and wounded patients were carried into the jungle to almost certain death. At Mang Khao Barai, 200 army officers were executed by being forced to walk through a carefully planted minefield. The Khmer Rouge cruelly beat a colonel, cut off his ears and nose, and then crucified him. The wives and children of these officers were then marched off to be killed. In all, more than four million city dwellers were dumped into the desolate jungle tracks to carve out a new communist society, untainted by their former exposure to bourgeois living. Cambodia had been the rice bowl of Indochina, but the new residents of the jungle camps were given only 90 grams of rice per day less than 15% of the minimum requirement for a normal worker. Malnutrition became rampant, and the usual ravages of disease followed. People resorted to eating leaves, snakes, worms, termites to sustain themselves. But the areas around their campsites were quickly depleted even of these supplements. Complaining about the food was a capital offense. Married couples were forbidden to carry on prolonged conversations. The punishment for the second offense was death. People were executed for any suspected dissent or lingering, often being forced to dig their own graves. Children were forced to watch as their parents were tortured, bludgeoned, decapitated, and stabbed to death. In the first wave of terror during 1975 and 1976, more than 1 1.2 million Cambodians were executed or died of disease, starvation in the new villages. By the end of 1978, approximately 2.4 Cambodian, 2.4 million Cambodians 
had died at the hands of communist liberators, 25% of the total population. In South Vietnam, the new communist regime promptly executed over 100,000 potential political enemies. Another one million people, including virtually the entire South Vietnamese intelligentsia, were sent to prisons or concentration camps. Between 200,000 and 340,000 of these political prisoners were still being held in 1985. Yet another million South Vietnamese considered disloyal to the new communist regime were sent to new economic zones to clear land and dig irrigation ditches. Malnutrition and disease took a high toll of these unfortunate South Vietnamese patriots. Somewhere between 200,000 and 500,000 died in these prisons and work camps. In 1978, Hanoi decided to rid Vietnam of several hundred thousand ethnic Chinese. They were driven into the South China Sea where they attempted to escape in small boats. Hundreds of thousands of other Vietnamese fleeing communist repression also tried to leave by boat. A conservative estimate is that 600,000 drowned at sea. <clears throat> in addition, tens of thousands of South Vietnamese prisoners of war never returned. Total South Vietnamese death under communist rule probably exceeded 1.1 million. In addition, freedom of speech and the press ceased. Religion was systematically suppressed. A government of corruption became the norm. And, the, and just before, uh, much more corrupt than anything they'd ever seen in Z, under Zien. Before 1975, South Vietnam had three TV stations, 20 radio stations, and 27 daily newspapers. Following the fall of Saigon, the new communist government allowed one TV station, two radio stations, and only two daily newspapers, all pumping out the same communist propaganda. The terrible consequence of communist victory was that more than 3.5 million Cambodian and North and South Vietnamese civilians were murdered, starved to death, or drowned in the South China Sea. Was this the better life for most that the New York Times predicted? Most anti-war liberals and the press and, and Congress pleaded ignorance. They claimed they did not know such a tragedy would result. This ignorance, however, is hardly excusable. The ruthless and bloody history of communism was clear to anyone who was not predisposed, predisposed to deny it. Shortly after Ho Chi Minh's victory over a French expeditionary force in 1954, he had General Vo Giap execute That's Hoji Man. <clears throat> he had General uh, Bo Gia execute 50,000 nationalist political opponents. The Viet Cong assassinated uh, over 37,000 government officials, school teachers, and village leaders during their early stage of terrorism in South Vietnam. Communist cadres brutally executed between three and 8,000 civilians in Way during the 1968 Tet Offensive. North Vietnamese artillery barrages killed 25,000 refugees fleeing Quang Tri province in 1972. Had no one noticed these atrocities? The North Korean government murdered 50,000 political dissenters when it came into power after World War II, and has since murdered close to 1.3 million of its own people to maintain a stranglehold on political power. R.J. Rummel's Death by Government, published in 1994, estimated that the Soviet Union murdered nearly 55 million of its own people and another 10 million of their nation other nationalities in consolidating its evil empire. Stalin starved to death nearly 25% of the population of Ukraine in 1932 and 1933, a total of seven million people, including three million children. Rommel originally estimated that the People's Republic of China murdered 38 million of its people in gaining and maintaining communist power, but later revised his estimate to nearly 77 million to account for Mao's forced collectivization of small farms and the resulting severe famine 
during the 1958 to 1962 great leap forward. In more recent history, 800,000 Tibetans have died in China's genocidal suppression of non-communist culture, religion, and philosophy. Of the top 10 murderers of all time, five were communists. Both Stalin and Mao Zedong more than doubled Hitler's 20 million. And Lenin is also on the list with four million people that he killed between 1917 and 1924. The bloody consequences of communist rule in Cambodia and South Vietnam were easily predictable to those thinking, whose thinking was not shackled to left liberal ideology and millions of innocent people who desired to be free were abandoned to oppression or death by a US Congress whose majority preferred willful ignorance and political expediency to responsibility and honor. Here's a bottom line lesson. Communism is not a harmless ideology. Communism places little or no value on life if it gets in the way of their ideology. Bullying, pain, and fear rank high in their methods of persuasion. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the American front. I'll try to be brief. It really, uh, to highlight it, you have to start looking at it at tit, but it was going on uh, before then. On January 29th, 1968, the NVA and VC announced a truce for the Tet holiday. Six hours later, they threw a force of 70,000 VC and 15,000 NVA troops into an elaborate plan throughout most of the country to bring down the South Vietnamese government. Contrary to US news media, the communist Tet Plan was an overwhelming victory for South Vietnam and American forces and a disastrous defeat for the communists, although it was not immediately known. By February 12th, the NVA and VC had lost 32,000 of their force killed in action. Based on an unsuccessful VC attempt to capture the US embassy on January 31st, however, CBS evening News anchor Walter Cronkite declared that the war was a useless stalemate and panicked Johnson and the administration and many in Congress. By the end of February, the communist Tet Force had lost 45,000 killed in action, and Allied killed in action totaled about 1,000 Americans and 2,100 South Vietnamese. By the end of 1968, communist forces had lost 100,000, and the V see have almost wiped out just in one year, 1968. North Vietnamese leaders were astonished that despite their terrible defeat, the US media and panicked politicians had handed them a tremendous political victory. Consequently, they stepped up their, stepped up their agitation and propaganda on the American home front. In April 26, 1968, 200,000 people in New York City demonstrated against the war. Uh, August 1968, you had the uh, convention uh, riots, the Democratic Convention. To further coordinate their agitation and political assault on the American homeland with international communist leadership, the North Vietnamese organized a Stockholm conference held in May 1969 and the representatives of North Vietnam and the Viet, and the Viet Cong were there, but three left-wing American anti-war organizations were also there. A subsequent planning meeting uh, called a peace assembly was held in communist East Berlin in June. The assembly received formal greetings from the Soviet Union's top leaders, Leonid Brezhnev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, the top dog, and also Alexei Kosygin. The chairman and uh, members uh, were obviously uh, strongly behind uh, the second front. And the, the demonstrations went on, and uh, they organized in the United States something called MOB, M-O-B-V, the movement, uh, New Mobilization Committee to End the War, 
uh, but it was all orchestrated from the left. October 15, 1969, Senator Edward Kennedy urged the United States to make an irrevocable decision to withdraw ground combat, combat forces from Vietnam by the end of 1972. However, support for the anti-war activities began to dwindle in 1969 as the new President Richard Nixon began to implement Vietnamization. Also, and this is a good idea, several members of Congress made it a daily practice to read reports of North Vietnamese atrocities in the congressional record. Anti-war protests erupted again in 1970 over Cambodia. Although constantly in the news, the anti-war demonstrators had comparatively little impact on the vast majority of the American public who, regardless of their frustrations with the war, viewed anti-war demonstrators as distasteful and unpatriotic. Sadly, however, the anti-war movement had a major impact on Congress. Uh, President Nixon was re-elected in 1975 with a big, big margin, but he was in trouble over Watergate by 1974 and that caused a large upheaval in the, in the November 1974 elections with more trouble in Congress. The real damage to the prospect of honorable peace in Vietnam was done in Congress. It came in the form of misguided resolutions forbidding US ground or air operations in Cambodia and Laos, thus allowing North Vietnamese to strike at South Vietnam from enemy, enemy sanctuaries without fear of American interference or retribution. Even more importantly, it came from the form of budget reductions and restrictions that eventually left South Vietnam and Cambodia unable to defend themselves against a North Vietnamese army lavishly equipped and supplied by their Soviet and Chinese sponsors. In December 1972, Strategic bombing of North Vietnam and, Na and Navy mining of Haiphong Harbor brought the communist leaders in Hanoi to their knees. In January 1973, Paris, the Paris Peace Treaty obligated the U.S. to continue financial support for South Vietnam's defense at 1973 levels and to come to their aid if attacked again by North Vietnam. However, despite our military victory, and our commitment to the 1973 peace treaty, a majority in Congress was ready to abandon our commitments to South Vietnam and Cambodia. March 29, 1973, all 591 American prisoners of war had been released. But this reduced congressional interest in the fate of South Vietnam. Here is how Congress caused the fall of Cambodia and Vietnam in April 1973, following a major NVA offensive in January 1975. Uh, the, the budget of 2.27 billion was to be the ongoing budget. And it was in 1973. But by 1974, they had reduced it almost to non-support is 1.03 billion. And by 1975, with the new Congress, it was, on, it was less than 700 million. Meanwhile, the Soviets and Chinese increased support to North Vietnam by 50% over the level of 1972 and 10% higher than their peak in 1971. The Cambodians literally ran out of ammunition. The South Vietnamese army out of almost everything, including any hope for American help. On hearing of the fall of South Vietnam, U.S. Senator Hiram Fong from Hawaii stated, there is no question but what we have betrayed the Cambodians and we have betrayed the South Vietnamese. We have not lived up to our commitments. The Vietnam War was a two-front war. While we had essentially won the war on the battlefields, the American front was essentially lost by the media and Congress. Well, thank you for... Uh, Hearing all that, I'm giving you ammunition, ideological ammunition, facts, because we're still in a war. And we're seeing it in Ken Burns. But I, I wanted to give you a little bit of advice about uh, some things that I'd heard about what people were doing about the Ken Burns thing. Uh, 
some stuff I've heard uh, that some people wanted to uh, spend a half a million dollars on an ad in the Wall Street Journal. And if they can find somebody that has the money and wants to do that, that'd be okay. But uh, I don't think that'd be a very lasting effect. Uh, videos help uh, if, if they're good and you, you can afford to do that. Uh, keep on doing it. Uh, I think that this is a club that can do that. My ideas are not grand about these things, but they are, uh, are affordable in money and time. It is a grassroots effort that often wins the bigger and longer term battle. And this is a long term battle for truth. If you have a speaker's bureau, and I know you do, that's good. But I would recommend more widespread grassroots uh, participation. Everybody that can ought to be out there giving 20 or 30 minute talks to civics clubs, political clubs, women's clubs, veterans organizations, history clubs, whatever. In Henderson, North Carolina, Hendersonville, North Carolina, I began by writing brief letters to civic organizations offering to speak. And many of these are glad to have available speakers and backup speakers. Other opportunities to influence the community can be developed by networking. Uh, I would also use forwarding emails, posting things on Facebook. Write a little sentence or two so it's personal from you. Uh, short letters to the editor are okay, but it can be very frustrating. Uh, some general advice, don't let critics and turn downs discourage you. Historical truth often gets some resistance and criticism. Your personal touch by people that are known to you are, is more lasting, even than a big name speaker. It's just they know you, they're gonna listen to you. And pace yourself. It's a long haul and we need to keep it going. But I sure have appreciated uh, being here today, I appreciated your presentations. I'd, I'd love to have a letter uh, that Susan's got. Appreciate everything that you're doing. Appreciate that slide presentation that you, you gave. And, but I, I thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, may God bless every one of you and God bless America. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I don't think it should be lost on anyone, the amount of uh, hard work, uh, research that has gone into uh, Mike Scruggs' books, uh, as well as his talk and the facts and figures. Uh, he's available back here by uh, Jim Dixon with both of his books. And I want to thank both you and your wife for participating with us today. Thank you very much for journeying here for being with us, and God bless you. Thank you for your service.